So just w what have you experienced personally then? Well, in this room, um, this is called the still room and it's, it's one of the oldest rooms in the castle. It's part of the, one of the towers. Uh, I was in here one night uh, with a gentleman who was standing over near the fireplace and I could hear your footsteps coming across the floorboards from, from where you were standing. And you could actually hear them moving across the room towards where, where we were. Um, and another time I was in here, I heard voices uh, sort of shouting, men's voices coming from the, the old dungeon there. So th there's lots of things happening here. Obviously, all the visitors that we have and all the staff over the years have had lots of experiences in here. People have regularly seen the shadowy figure of an old lady um, in the area of the, the cooking range over there. And one of these rocking chairs has been seen to move before by itself. About the other staff experiences then, if you just let one know a little bit about that one. Yeah, well, <clears throat> this room's a bit of a thoroughfare. It, it goes to some of our accommodation at the back here. So lots of people come through here. And one of the most regular things is the sound of men's voices. Raised voices if they're shouting or arguing, coming from within the dungeon behind the locked door. So what, what was the dungeon used for then? Well, the dungeon was used for two things. Primarily to keep prisoners. Uh, these prisoners would be seized in battle. You know, the, the Scottish Wars of Independence raged for hundreds of years here and all the border raver kind of things that were going on. So they'd be kept there. But also, if the castle was under attack, all the important people could hide in there and be safe in there. So it had two, two uses, really. Does it not scare you or anything? The, the, it the, used to. It, it would do a lot of people. <coughs> Pe people are more scared when, when they come here mm. than when, it, when it's actually happening. Because if you see something or you feel something, it's quite intriguing, you know, you're completely focused on what's happening. Yeah. So you don't tend to get too frightened. But um, there have been one or two things, and I'll, I'll tell you about them when we get there, yeah. that have happened to me that have scared me a bit. Yeah, the castle has a curse. Yes, yeah, so it's people stealing. Yeah. Things. Yeah, this lady up here in this painting, she's called the Spanish Witch. Oh, really? And she came here in the medieval period, and she put a curse on the castle. But it was a good curse and it protected the castle and everybody within. So as long as nobody <clears throat> does anything to the detriment of the castle, you'll be fine. But we have had guests in recent years who've decided to take some souvenirs away with them. And they've had such bad luck and ill health right. as a result of the curse that they've actually returned them to try and lift the curse. Wow. Yeah. So the dungeon's quite, quite good. Yeah. yeah. I'll just be careful, it's a little bit uneven yeah. on your feet there. No worries. And also, when you go in, if you look just to the right here, you can see the, the re remains of an old sacred passage that's been blocked up. Because there used to be tunnels in all the walls, uh -huh. so you could walk round without being seen. But they've long, long since been blocked up. It's a bit cramped, yeah. but that's the original doorway you're going through there. So this is a sort of seven, eight hundred year old door here. Wow. Uh -huh. Oh, bloody hell! And down in that hole is the uh, the lower part of the chamber because there's two parts to it. <laughs> Most sort of uh, Norman medieval dungeons had the same format, the top chamber and the bottom. Yeah. It's in a box. I, I honestly don't know. I think it's just there for a bit of right. dressing of the room. Yeah. Oh, 
갑자기니까. And as I went through the door, they started shouting and screaming, and I didn't know what was going on. But apparently, as I'd gone in through that really tight door, the little ghostly image of a dog had shot through my legs and ran in towards them. So I, I missed that one. Yeah. But, uh, Close enough to see. I was frightened the, the life yeah. out of them. <clears throat> but the, you know, we we believe that they used to put dogs into there. In years gone by to clear all the mess up. Yeah. So maybe that fit, fits with the what dog happened. Yeah, yeah. Uh. All right. So we get things happening even in the courtyard. Mm. What happened in the court? Well, um, like on a morning like we have now, there's, there's nobody here apart from a few staff members. And quite regularly they can hear the noise of children playing in the courtyard here. But obviously there's, there's no children here. Yeah. And people have also heard the clip clucking of hooves, horses' hooves, um, dogs barking, things like that. And of course there's nothing here. So where are we headed next? Right, thing? we're going to go yep. to our torture chamber. <coughs> Just as a, a, an aside, uh, in Victorian times, these archways were all covered up, <coughs> and this was all part of the staff uh, accommodation. I don't know if your camera can get it, but you can see the old bellboard up here. Yeah. And um, it's got all the different room room names like blue room and drawing room. And obviously the bells would ring and the staff would have to zip up there to, to deal with it, whatever. But this is our torture chamber. Dark in here, I'm afraid. There's a lot of medieval kind of torture devices. <coughs> yeah, there's. It, it, it's an exhibition space. Um, this was never really the torture chamber, but you know, it's it's here for the tourists to enjoy, mm -hmm. and it's got a lot of sort of Elizabethan Spanish Inquisition type torture devices here for them to look at, and it's it's even got some agricultural implements in here as well. <coughs> but predominantly, you know, torture bits, and here we've got some original medieval man traps that would have been used here at Chillingham. This is always one of my favourites up here. So what's this one? Well, this is a school's bridal. And the idea was that if your, your wife or your, the lady you lived with or whatever, she'd 
misbehaved or she was telling lies or gossiping or something like that, then you could hire that from the local sheriff and you, your wife would have to wear it and she'd be ridiculed and punished. You know. But just gossiping? Well, if she misbehaved, whatever was going yeah. on, she would be uh, forced to, to wear that. And oh. the top of that one would have had a little bell hanging off it. And some of them had a piece of metal that would have rested on, on her tongue to stop her talking. Oh. So it's like a humiliation thing as well, Paul. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So this is called an Iron Maiden. <coughs> so with this, I think Rebecca was telling us, is this, oh, well, this is probably not the one where it was like, if you're a witch, you get put in there and then rolled down or oh, something. Right. Or no, was that, she, or was that was further talking, up? She was talking about I thought that might have been it. Yeah. <laughs> Nice bed of nails. Yeah. She would have been shackled to that and then would have lit the fire and, and sort of pulled the fire up and down with chains to heat you up from to top to toe, if you like. Wow. Encourage you to tell your secrets. And these barrels here were the, uh, the witch barrels. But you can see they've got some nasty nails inside. <coughs> and... If they thought you were a witch, they would put you in there and sh shut the lid tight. And then they would roll you down the hill at the back of the castle here and let it plop into the moat. And then they'd eventually fish you out. And if you were alive, well, then you were a witch. Because only a witch could survive such a thing. And if you were dead, well, then you were innocent. So you're dead if you do, dead if you don't, really, then? You, you, you're stuck between the, the devil and the deep blue sea, if you like, with that one. Mm. I mean, just looking at that, I don't know how anyone would be able to even survive that, rolling no, down with all them pins. So what about some of these ones that we've passed then? So this, <coughs> well, this, this one's where it turns you out. Yeah, this what? is called a rack. This was a, an Elizabethan torture device. And famous people like Guy Fawkes were tortured in the Tower of London, mm -hmm. using one of these until he confessed to his plot to king, kill King James I. So just in case the camera can't pick it up, it's literally just rolling these things and stretching your limbs until yes, they Yes, you, you would basically work. be stretched until your tendons and your joints came apart. Wow. No, it's, it's a little friendly mock-up that we have. <laughs> but it's a good point you make because there's been something like seven or eight skeletal remains, bodies, found within the castle over the last couple of hundred years. Mm. And, and I'll point some of the locations out yeah, as we go around. Well, a little girl we've got lost. A little girl, yeah. yeah. And we've got a little, a little blue boy we can, we can tell you about. Don't know the story with that one, but I heard that that's on yeah. the list. So there are spirits of children still here at the castle as well as you know, adults. So we've got a chair with a bed of nails as well. Yes, now um, these were found all over Europe. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> again around the sort of Elizabethan era and people would be forced to sit on them and of course you would think well it's going to hurt but I'm probably going to survive this yeah. however if you if you think about it there were no antibiotics or antiseptics or anything like that a lot of infections so you're going to get a bad bad infection probably die of blood poisoning or something like that wow. so the last thing you wanted was was to, to go on that really well I'm just thinking that's a bloke, it's, it's a genitalia and everything that It's they... not going to be comfy, no. Not, not in the slightest. Oh. So with this, is this, because obviously you mentioned there was like the Scottish versus England kind of, of war that was yeah. going on. Would it be that a lot of the Scottish who were tortured here or would they just be held in the dungeon? They would be held prisoner <coughs> because the English were very keen to know what their plans were. Mm. And they wanted to know where they were camped, how many you know, archers they had, how many cannons they had, how many cavalry they had, all these sort of things. Did they plan to attack? Did they plan to come down south again? So they would, they would interrogate them, if you like. Um, and, and, and you've seen the dungeon, you know, they'd, they'd be held in the dungeon. 
Uh, but it's not huge as well, so it's, for holding it's, it's like lots not, and lots of people. It's a dreadful space, and of course they didn't really use to feed them very much. Um, very, very uncomfortable. And I think they'd be quite happy to, um, you know, divulge the secrets to, to get, get out, out, to mm. be released, or make a swift, swift end. Would, would it be a case if they did divulge their secrets, would they be killed because they're not useful anymore, and, or would they generally be let <coughs> go? Do you know, I honestly don't know. Yeah. I honestly don't know. The, the, there are some schools of thought that say that um, torture was discouraged f for a number of reasons. And one was it was uh, frowned upon by the church mm. at that time. But secondly, if, if you do it to your enemy, then your enemy are going to do it to you. So if, if you treat each other with a bit of respect, hopefully you'll be treated with respect if you're ever yeah. captured. So I don't really know is the honest answer. Um, I suspect a bit of it would go on, mm. but um, perhaps not to a great extent because of the repercussions of that behaviour. Yeah. It's like a mutual kind of... Mutual respect. Yeah. Yeah. But they would most definitely want to know what was going on, I'm sure. Yeah. Because I think as well it was like tens of thousands, wasn't there, of deaths or something? <coughs> well, you know, we... Let, let's go back to 1298 when Edward I stayed at this castle. He brought an army here to fight the Scots. So that's 1298. It was still going on during the reign of Elizabeth I in the 1500s, 1600s. So that there's quite a time span of conflict and huge battles. Um, you know, we had the Battle of Flodden in 1513, which was just about six miles up the road. And um, James IV, Scottish King, died on the battlefield. And that happened all, all around here. It was a huge battle. There was something like 15,000 people died on that particular battlefield. So huge numbers of, of deaths, huge numbers of prisoners. Um, all, and all the castles around here involved in all of that. You know, Ford, Lanark, Berwick, uh, Hetton, Horton. There's loads of castles. Norham, Wark. What have I named there? 10, 12 castles all involved in all this conflict within probably a, what, 20 mile radius. So a lot of history, a lot of yeah. uh, issues going on up here. It was all territorial, yeah? Everyone yeah, well, used to the, fight for their territory. Yeah, the it? Scots believed this was theirs mm -hmm. and the English believed that it was theirs. So that, that was the issue. And of course the Scots didn't like being governed by the English either. It's still going on, that now. <laughs> we'll perhaps, cut that bit perhaps, out. Perhaps it's still going on. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. yeah. <clears throat> now, originally, this, this room, you can see these big uh, windows here. These were, these were big um, cannon ports, and this room would have been f filled with cannons, lots of soldiers, lots of noise, mm -hmm. and um, they'd have been trying to kill the Scots who were streaming down down the hill from the south side. Huh. It's just crazy looking at them, but like trying to think, like, oh, imagine if you got taken to one of these places, no one, somehow you'd be, you know. I'd tell them straight away whatever yeah. I wanted to know. What do you want to know? Here you go. <laughs> yeah. So do you want to know a bit about the ghosty stuff in here? A bit, a bit of everything, yeah. So <coughs> the, the more stuff we have for the editors, the better, because yeah. then they can literally be like, oh, we'll, we'll not use that bit, yeah. but if we haven't got it, then we we'll haven't got it. <coughs> right. The scavenger's daughter. Normally when I have a group of people in, they, they all kind of stand where you are, and I'm telling them about the various bits and pieces that we have in here. And I had a group of ladies in the room on a hen night, <coughs> and um, all of a sudden they all started saying, Mark, look up, look up, and... When I looked up, this thing was spinning round above my head, all by itself. And all the girls saw it first. But the funny thing is, as you can see, it's bobbing about. You can't actually make it do circles. But on, on the night in question, it was going round and round and round. So that was quite, uh, quite interesting. It certainly grabbed their attention. And it's happened, it's happened twice in the last, sort of, what, four years, something like that. 
and also just where we're standing here, <clears throat> many, many people have seen the ghostly image of a little girl and they all describe her the same. She's wearing a long white dress, she's got long white gloves on and she's carrying a parasol. And uh, so vivid, so real is this image that um, not too long ago, a couple of years ago, one of our visitors ran um, to the shop next door to tell one of the members of staff that there was a little girl lost in the torture chamber. And of course, when they came to find her, she'd, she'd just vanished into thin air. And she's been seen many, many times, both here and just the other side of the door. Is, is there a name or person that you can put towards or just a random? No, it's just, no. just an image of a little mm -hmm. girl. And we get the usual kind of activities. We get little bits of things moving. Obviously, I've told you about this, but some other people have seen, seen this um, thing moving a little bit. People have heard voices and footsteps behind us at the bottom of the chamber. I'd imagine spirit-wise, this is probably going to be one of the rooms where you'd expect to see a lot if it's a torture room because a lot would have a lot of things have happened in here yeah. over the years but it's a very old building and been a lot of life and death here mm. <coughs> yeah right okay right, we're ready for the next one then all right Mind all steps there. Yeah. I'll be very careful. Thank you ever so much for letting us know. No. So we don't tend to do uh, a great deal in this room, but this room um, historically is very interesting. Mm. It's called the Berthiel Room, and it's named after a, an ex-German prisoner of war who stayed in, uh, in England after, after his release at the end of the Second World War. And he, he was a forestry worker around here, but his passion and his hobby was archaeology. <clears throat> and all the things that you can see in the various display cases are things that he found in the immediate area of Chillingham Castle. So we've got um, Neolithic items, we've got Roman things, because it was a Roman camp here. He was, he was awarded an, an MBA, I think it was, for his services to archaeology. Mm. Yeah. Which must have been quite something for an ex-German prisoner of war. <coughs> this is actually, I know it doesn't look it, but this is one of the oldest parts of the castle. This is the undercroft or the cellar of... Um, of the South East Tower, and this was the first tower to be built, so oldest part. And we believe there was a Roman camp here hmm. um, 2,000 years ago, right on this spot. So wh when was the castle built? <coughs> well, the castle was a Norman castle, hmm. so, you know, when the Normans came in 1066, they started to establish themselves in the south of the country, then move f further north. So the Normans came and, and they built um, the enhanced and Anglo-Saxon tower that was here. And then they, they continually modified and upgraded everything. But the castle, as you see today, um, I think 1344, they were given permission to extend and crenellate, which means put all the fortifications in. So it was a, it was a process from the Normans in 1066 up to... 1344 development and, and enhancement and, and what have you. And of course the castle, the castle was at war if you like until James the sixth of Scotland became James I of England and all the fighting between the English and the Scots tended to die down. So it's a long period of instability and fighting. 
Which I suppose is why you need cattle and stuff back then, yeah. And there's so many up here, mm -hmm. you know, purely and simply because of the Scottish English problem. All right, shall we? Yeah. Well, we want to be careful of these walls. <coughs> So during the season, this is the tea room where all the guests come and uh, they get looked after. But it's known as the Minstrels Hall. And up there is the Minstrels Gallery. And you can see mm -hmm. the beautiful original medieval cooking fire there. Have there been any tales or stories in this, this room? <coughs> oh yes, yeah. Yeah, indeed. Um, I did a ghost tour last Thursday, and right where we're standing here, all four of these chairs at the same time moved out. And all the people that were around, standing around, saw it happen. But over the years, there have been lots of things happening in here. Had so, are you just immune to it now then? Like, you've seen enough stuff happen where. It's always intriguing when you see. <clears throat> see things happen, it really is. Or you, you can sense something like the temperature just drops. Um, I find it really intriguing. And to be honest, not a lot of people get frightened by it because it it's just captures your, captures your mind and you just look and see what's going on, trying to figure out what's happening. <coughs> I was in here one day with a colleague and these two big chandeliers they were both spinning, great big circles in complete symmetry. And uh, we were talking earlier about things that frightened me. Mm. That, that was one of the things, that was the first time I'd seen anything dynamic really moving. And uh, it quite took me aback, I must say. And uh, we both left, we went into the courtyard and we came back about 10 minutes later. And they were both completely still just as you see them now. But they were really moving, there was great big wide swings. So before you'd started working here, had you had any paranormal or whatever we want to no. call it? No. Do you believe I it? No. <coughs> no, I was I, I wasn't interested in, in ghosts or spirits or anything like that. I, I came here, uh, a job opportunity popped up and it was to do with the history side of things. And um, that was what I was interested in. But slowly by and surely. You know, little bits of things started to happen. Uh, and then I started working on the ghost events and lots more things started to happen. Things like the ghost spinning. Last Thursday, all these chairs moving out. Um, people get their hair pulled in here. People sometimes get, uh, they can feel somebody tapping them on the shoulder. I actually heard some voices in here one night. Um, we're right next to the, uh, the loos here, and quite often on the tour, we'll break for a couple of minutes while people, you know, uh, pay a quick visit. So I was just standing over here waiting. There was a couple of ladies had gone, and um, I was just on my own. The rest of the group were in the room here. And then I heard this, this lady's voice in my left ear saying, oh, we're here now. So I turned around to say, oh, thank you very much for letting me know. And of course, when I turned around, there was nobody standing there at all. They vividly heard it sort of thing, yeah. yeah. Wow. Plain as day, a really nice, soft, well-spoken voice. Yeah, we're here now. And I thought the girls had come back from the loo. I was going to say thanks very much, and I was going to start the tour again. So, so that was quite interesting. What, what about the other staff? Is there any staff stories where they've heard stuff? And it's, oh, yes, yeah. yeah. <coughs> One of our cleaners... Um, she was up in the Edward room, which we're going to visit, and she was in there hoovering one morning on her own, and she heard this man's deep, gravelly voice saying, get out, this is my room, get out of here. And she was absolutely terrified. You know, she shot off out, and it probably took her about six months to build up the courage to go back into that room. But you could talk to every member of staff here, and they will all have had some sort of experiences.
there's nothing happened where people, the staff have just said, I can't, can't work here anymore right, with, with fear or... No, to, 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 to be honest, I think most of the staff have to, to, to just have to get on with it. Um, you know, one, one of the ghost guides, Bob, he's not here anymore. And I know he got frightened by the image of a ghost in this very room. Uh, a big black shadowy figure, great big tall thing, well over six feet tall. Um, but recently I don't know of anyone who's left because they're so frightened. Like I say, it really is. If, you, if we see something as we're going around today, it's, it's really intriguing and you, it kind of makes you want to see more. To kind process of it. process it and mm -hmm. did I actually see that? Did it really happen? Kind of thing. I was in here one evening, we just finished an event and I was chatting to a gentleman before he left. And as we were chatting, he saw what he described as a lady standing in the archway up there wearing a Victorian dress. So I spun round, but when I turned round, it had gone. So you get the full spectrum of activity in here. You, me you mentioned as well, you get like paranormal kind of investigators. Have they seen a lot when they've come yeah, here? We get a lot of people who come, they hire the castle to do their own investigations. And they regularly uh, treat it to a lot of things, mm -hmm. yeah. Because I'd imagine they'd have all like the barometers and technical equipment and everything. They bring a lot of technical yeah. equipment, a lot of uh, meters to try and pick up electromagnetic energy, things like that. A lot of things to record, faint noises. Um, yeah, and, and even m much more simple old fashioned things like divining rods, that, that spirits can move, things like that. You know, everybody, we try everything here. Mm. Yeah. What, what, what generally do you hear back from, from them after they've done their investigations? Um, mostly it's, it's about locations mm -hmm. where they got the best reactions. And they'll talk about the chapel, which is up here. They'll probably talk about this room. They'll talk about the Edward the First room, which we'll go and visit. And um, then it's normally, <clears throat> oh, we heard some noises, some tapping, things like that. Um, or the, their electronic meters were flashing up, things, like, things of that nature. But, you know, they'll try and interact with the spirits as well. And if you use divining rods, then you, you can ask close questions, get a yes or no answer to, and you can work things out with them. So, yeah. Has, any, has anyone ever been hurt with anything like that? Has anyone... We have had uh, one or two people who've been sort of pushed mm. and shoved in the back, and who one I have seen one chap fall over. <clears throat> and um, quite a few years ago, we had a lady who um, felt a, a burning sensation around her face. She felt quite unwell, sickly, and nauseous. When she came down to sort of freshen up in the toilet area, she noticed she had some scratches down the side of her face. But that's the worst we've had. Um, the other side of the coin is last Thursday when we had all these chairs moving. We had an old lady with us who suffered quite badly with arthritis. She had all her legs sort of quite heavily bandaged and she was having difficulty moving around the castle. When we got into the chapel, all the pain in her legs just went. And she said, it was unbelievable because she'd been struggling with, with pain all the way around the castle. When we got in there, all her pain just went. So, so what, when she left the room, was it just back to... Well, I was talking to her afterwards because mm. she was staying here. And she said she could feel it starting to come back and she needed to go, go get her painkillers. So I've never... That, that's a new one to, to me. I've never known anybody go in there and have that happen. So you get quite a nice view from up here. Yeah. Is this the chapel here? This is a chapel. Yeah. My favourite room. Favourite, yeah. Why is this, why is this one the favourite? Well, it's a lovely room. It's very atmospheric. 
And lots of stuff happens in here. So it almost goes without saying, is this the kind of room that people would obviously go and pray and stuff back in the... the <coughs> Excuse me. Well, this wasn't always a chapel. This, uh, this room's about 800 years old. So it's been many, many different things. And <coughs> back in Victorian times, it was actually a library and a writing room. But when... <coughs> Excuse me. When the current owner came to restore it, he found this rudimentary font hidden in the, the alcove there. So he decided to return it back to being the chapel that it must have been at some stage. But that's the old staircase you can see there. Yeah. When the... When the this tower was first built, that was the way in and out. Yeah. And obviously the ceiling height and room heights must have changed at some stage because we've got a doorway up there and the halfway up the wall now. Yeah. And that's an old arches window up there. So they've been firing at the Scots from that. Like crossbows and things. All and of that, yeah. yeah. Long bows, crossbows, rudimentary firearms. Well, one that happened to me that was the most frightening was I was standing exactly where you are and from the alcove there, I heard a deep, horrible, gravelly man's voice saying, get out, get out of my room, this is my room, you get out. And, uh, oh, I didn't like it at all, so I, I shut out the door. Um, and that was, <clears throat> that was the same night that the chandeliers had been spinning in the other room. So I was quite nervy anyway. Um, so the castle won that night and I, I zipped off home. So that's the worst it's ever been for me. Mm -hmm. uh, but lots of things happen in here. People come in here and have lots of great experiences. Uh, regularly they get their hair pulled in here, predominantly the ladies. Um, people will have something tap them. Uh, sometimes it can feel just a gentle shove in their back. So what, when stuff happens, is it normally an isolated incident where it just happens for that second? Or like you said here, when it was outside and then here on the same night, just does things happen? <coughs> yeah. What we found when we've done all our little investigations in the castle is that the spirits actually follow you around because they're quite interested in you and what you do. Um, so you might have some interactions up in one of the rooms at the top of the tower and then they'll follow you down here and it'll be the same thing. Um, regularly in here we get temperature changes where it gets really freezing cold. You'll feel a body of cold air come around you and that's associated with spirits because we think they take the heat out of the air to energize themselves so we'll, we'll do a myriad of you know uh, investigative things in here all the <coughs> different meters and recording devices uh, down to things like pendulums and and divining rods the most simplest of tools mm -hmm. uh, and or sometimes we'll ask you know for for somebody to tap. Now this room is associated with the spirit of a little girl called Eleanor and we believe that Eleanor died in the corner of the room here mm. and at the time this wasn't a chapel so it wasn't really consecrated ground so she's you know she's not 
at rest, if you like. And Eleanor regularly interacts with people in this room because she likes to have a play and a mess around mm -hmm. with people. But mm -hmm. you do tend to know that if Eleanor's about, you will feel that temperature drop. Mm -hmm. But I, I do, I do think we can feel a bit of a coolness here. Now there was um, two bodies found in this room. Skeletal remains, not entire bodies. There was a lady who used to live here called Leonora Tangerville. And she was an American lady and she married the seventh Earl, George Montague Bennett, the Earl of Tangerville. He owned this castle. And she came here in something like 1894. And she loved all the stories of the ghosts and the spirits. And she used to go looking all over the castle for them. And she, she was an avid diarist and she used to write in her diary every day here in the library. And while she was in here, so the story goes, she heard men's voices coming from below the window. Mm -hmm. And so she got some of the workmen to come in and they lifted the floorboards. And there's quite a big void, big hole down there. And at the bottom were two skeletal remains. Like I say, Eleanor, we, although nobody knows if our body was ever found, th through the investigations, you know, we believe she died in the corner of the room here. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to go and visit somewhere where the little blue boy was found. What's the story with the little blue boy? What was that like? Well, the little blue boy used to appear to people in a particular room. And again, Leonora Tangerville went in there one night and uh, she wanted to experience it. And at the stroke of midnight, the room went really, really cold. And blue flashing lights came out of a wall next to the fireplace. And then immediately thereafter appeared the image of a small boy surrounded by a blue light. So the next day she got the workman to open up a hole where the lights were. When the hole was big enough, she sort of snuck in with a candle and had a look and the, the remains of a small child were there wrapped in blue material. So the child was, was brought out and buried in the church next door. And um, to that day, he's never appeared again. Although people say they can still see the lights coming out the wall. But during some investigations that we've had here, the blue boy has indicated that he's still here in, in spirit, but not, you know, he doesn't appear as a ghostly figure anymore.